All right. Thank you very much for coming. Um, <clears throat> light microscopy is a fascinating field of research. In the last year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, went to three researchers for the development of super-resolution fluorescence microscopy. And these techniques allow us to look at single molecules. And so we can reveal cells in far greater detail and look at their molecular components than we thought was physically possible. Another breakthrough has been happening, and this has to do not with how small an object you can image, but for how long you can do so. And I want to talk about this live imaging and a powerful technique that you can use for this. And I would like to use research that we do at the university as an example. So, okay, we should have here a coral reef, which we don't. Okay, doesn't matter. Um, if you have a coral reef, what you will get with that, oh, because I deleted it before, that's the problem. If you have a coral reef, it um, supports the um, most kind of uh, species that you can have, and more so than any other area in the sea or on land. And so they are very important um, ecosystems. And they are also having a very hard time due to uh, global warming, ocean acidification, pollution, and many other man-made factors. Now, if we want to conserve corals for the future, we need to have the best knowledge of biological um, happenings in corals, of the coral biology, so we can make the best management decisions. One way to do that is to go out in the field and um, measure different species in different locations over time. That is what the Coral Reef Research Unit does. Um, I don't particularly care for sharks, so one other way to do it is to take these corals into the lab and grow them there on uh, slides and look at them in the microscope. And both of these will add tremendously to um, our understanding of corals because many of their basic aspects are still poorly understood. And one reason for this is that corals are, I'm, I'm afraid to say, in, in some ways a little bit weird. For centuries they have puzzled scientists who were um, unable to tell are they rocks or are they plants or are they animals. And if you take a reef building coral, it, it is made up of um, polyps and a polyp is essentially a food tube with tentacles at the end. And so it can grab prey and eat it. It also has a primitive nervous system. It has muscles and so corals are animals. At the same time though, they have um, inside their tissue, living in harmony with them, algae. And these algae can provide up to 90% of the nutrients for a coral through photosynthesis. And that makes them quite a bit like plants. All the while, they are depositing a form of limestone, and they build these complex 3D uh, structures. And um, these can be absolutely huge. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest living structure on, on this planet. And that makes them quite a bit like rocks. And you have all of these components, and I'm interested in looking at the interaction of these in live corals. So we take fragments, we put them on microscopy slides, and they will spread outwards and grow upwards, and they will thicken. And I want to follow this over time. The first technique I used for this um, was confocal. And the full name is confocal, laser scanning microscopy. And what this gave me um, were fantastic three-dimensional images of coral architecture. What you can see here is you are looking head-on at the tip of a branch of a staghorn coral. And you can see in green the coral tissue, and in red you have the bands of um, algae. And you can see these four holes, and those are caves that the polyps make so they can pull back into them. 
You will also notice that we don't see any polyps because they have pulled back fully. So it turns out that staghorn corals really hate the bright light of the confocal. Um, what's more, many of them died after once uh, or twice imaging, so this was hardly a good solution for um, long-term imaging, despite the wonderful 3D information that I was um, getting with this. Okay. So I switched to a different technique, which is um, called wide field fluorescence microscopy. And this is much more um, sensitive. And what wide field allows you to do is use much less light. And lo and behold, I was able to see the corals, uh, the polyps, and they came out to play. And the corals were happy. I could do long-term imaging, so I was happy as well. The problem is that 3D information in wide field microscopy is not that fantastic. So here we are going through a sample in focal uh, planes, and so you, we, we are stepping through it. And you can put these focal planes together to a volume. And here we have such a volume, and we can rotate it, but I trust you will find, as I did, that this is not terribly convincing. And this is where this powerful technique comes in. This is light sheet fluorescence microscopy, also called selective plane illumination microscopy, or short SPIM. And SPIM combines the best of both worlds. It takes the good 3D information from the confocal and combines that with the high sensitivity, low light approach of the wide field. To explain how it does it, I need to simplify things a bit. Some might say this is gross um, simplification, but bear with me. So we have here a bunch of cells. This is essentially your organism. And we have at the bottom a lens that is essentially your microscope. And we also need light to shine on the cells. And so we focus on the bottom layer, expose it to light, take an image. Focus on the middle layer, expose, take image, focus on the top, expose, take image. And from these different layers, we can take the focus information and put the, that together in one fully focused three-dimensional image. And the problem is, in live imaging, you do this time and again. And it is only a question of time before your cells start to feel a little bit unsure about the amount of light they are exposed to, because much like us, they can get a sunburn. And this can progress to the stage where some of them might even die. And that um, is, a, is a real problem, because suddenly you are no longer looking at natural behavior, but you are looking at your organism, how it reacts to damage inflicted by light. So you really want to reduce this. You can't avoid it, you will need light, but you can reduce it. And light sheet microscopy does this with a very simple and very efficient trick. What you do is you shine the light in from the side, and then you take a cylindrical lens, and this will scrunch the laser beam down to a light sheet. And this very thin light sheet you can use to now illuminate a single plane a single layer of cells. And then you do what you did before. You focus on the bottom plane, expose, take image, and so on, as before. But at the end of this, you will have exposed your whole sample to a lot less light than with any of the conventional techniques, because when they take a focal plane, they illuminate the whole volume. And so you get good optical sections, and you get massive reduction in light. So what's not to like? So I knew I wanted to use this technique. The problem was I had to build a microscope like that, because at the time there was none commercial available. SPIM has only been around um, since about 2004. And um, I got a small grant from the Royal Society, and with the help of an online community called openspim.org, um, I was able to build one. And they tell you how to put together a microscope like that and how to operate it. And as one person said, their instructions would put 
um, IKEA to shame. And so I built it and uh, was able to put a couple of twists to it. And um, so here it is in action. And we are looking at a coral fragment and scanning over the top of it with this broad um, laser light sheet. And as you can see, at any time, only very little of the sample is exposed to light. You can then take all these lines and put them together in one image, and you can see here that all of the polyps um, have come out to play. And so we are using very little light with, with this. One of the twists I added was that I wanted to look at big samples. And um, I created a very broad uh, light sheet. And with this, I can look at samples. In this case, this is two and a half by two by one centimeters large. In microscopy terms, this is huge. So that was one thing. And this gives me really nice 3D information. And I can see how much of the coral is growing outwards and how much is upwards and thickening. So I get all of that. The other really crucial bit of the microscope is that I have the gentlest possible illumination. And I pulse it. So in between the pulses, you get periods of darkness. And the cells can recover in those periods. And that means you get really very low levels of light. And I realized this when one day I noticed that I had been imaging the same sample for over three months and over 100 hours of illumination, and it still grew happily. So either that meant I had some coral that could not die, which didn't seem likely, or indeed my levels of light were so low that I was not impacting on the growth. And that means that I can observe without disturbing. And that's kind of a big thing for, for a biologist. I've been able to show that um, in biophysical means. I can't bore you with those. But one way to show that is by using a staghorn polyp. As we know, they hate bright light. And this one is exposed to half an hour of continuous illumination, and it never pulls back. It only comes out a little bit more. And with these levels of light, we can now get closer to some of the best kept secrets of corals. So for example, early development. Corals start li life as a larva. Here we have a larva of favia, and it's swimming around in circles and dipping in and out of the light sheet. And this larva will, in good conditions, settle and then metamorphosize into uh, the first polyp. And this is a very uh, delicate and critical step. And because we have these low light levels, we have been able to follow this from the first day of settlement through to day eight. And here we have it. And um, you can see these different stages. So the cloche hat and uh, the Google op and here the madcap. And I might work on the terms a bit more. But this is all in the same sample. And we are following that. And it grows happily. So for me, this is really looking at life as it unfolds. And that's what I find tremendously exciting. To conclude, what I would like to say is that, A, quite a few people were involved. So um, Dave Smith from the Coral Reef Research Unit, he is the, the director. Sophie Stevenson was my master's, who took um, many of uh, the primary polyp uh, images, which also means that my microscope can be used by someone else. So that's good. Um, Jamie Craggs is an expert in aquarium husbandry. He gave us um, the larvae. He's at the Horniman Museum in London. And I received funding from the Royal Society and Nikon Instruments and Cairn Research for this. My system works for corals, and it is built for comfort, not for speed. But there are many other setups out there, and they can do absolutely amazing things. Things You have some jet-propelled ones, some super-resolved ones. And if you ever find yourself with a little bit of time, 
and internet access and you're not sure what to do, I can strongly recommend searching for light sheet microscopy. And what you can see are different organisms. For example, the embryo of a fruit fly where the cells divide in waves and start to make the, the different germ layers. Or you can look at the firing neurons in the brain of a tiny fish. You can even look at single red blood cells in its beating heart. Um, and one of my personal favorites is the interaction of two cells, one colored orange and one in blue. And this is super resolved, so that's combining um, Again, two of these breakthroughs in one. And these cells make only what I can um, see as, as an absolutely beautiful cellular dance. So if you ever find the time, I really suggest you, you go and have a look at that. And that's it for light sheet microscopy, and thank you very much for your time.